study. Very, very, these are some of the examples of models that I was telling you before the break that have uh, guided research in health communication and provided so much of detail about the different processes through which human beings make decisions. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's targeting human beings. Here are some examples of that. So I'm going to sum up this whole thing for you. What we have been discussing until now under development communication and under social psychological approaches to communication, you would notice that the field of health communication has been steered in one direction. That is, impact of information dissemination through media under development com and communication on individual behaviors in um, psychosocial theories. And basically what these, uh, uh, what these have done is that in, in, in theories of modernization and development, um, basically these are some of the ideas that are stressed that always looked at individuals, changing of individuals. That's great if you're, if you're targeting one individual, but most social innovations target a community, target a family, target a dyad, a triad, you know. Um, the idea that communication is nothing but information transfer, which is a very anemic concept of communication. It is communication, but communication is much more than that. Also something else that I have not even mentioned until now is, the mode of research has been of only one kind, the quantitative method using statistics. So in all of this we have talked about, the when it comes to analysis of data, it is reducing your data to numbers, using a statistical package and running and looking for correlations. This is what we do in quantitative studies. And again, there's nothing wrong in that, but that is the only kind, okay? And we know, or now I'm going, to st I'm going to spend about 10 minutes critiquing this. What have we been missing? What should we also be looking at? Today we do. Today we incorporate, uh, you know, uh, a much more holistic perspective. So what we have been missing came to us starting around the 1980s. There was a lot of, because of the ferment in the field of social sciences, there was a lot of criticism of Western imported, exported theories. Because first of all, they were not going very well in settings like India and other places where the conditions were very different. Am I making that noise? Okay. <laughs> we are going to put this category of studies or theories under interpretive uh, theories of communication. Communication and one aspect of that is for me to in transfer information to you, but it's much more than that. Communication is a dynamic interaction between two or more participants. Remember, we want to build commonness. So communication is a very dynamic give and take, give and take between actors, two or three or four. Not just passive transfer of information, okay? So these earlier theories they criticized said, these theories and models took a very narrow view of communication. They also took a very, very narrow view of health. What is health? Now this, now all of us should be concerned because we all are in a human body, unless one of these Hollywood films, you know, you're actually a werewolf. At six o'clock you become a wolf. Uh, <laughs> we're all human beings, right? So, we all have health, we all have a body, okay, health. 
<coughs> there is a difference between two concepts. I'm going to introduce two concepts to you now. Health is one, the other is well-being. Okay? All, you know, no, before I say that. But in the Western systems of medicine, which is pr pr prominent in what we do today, which has come to us from the West, health is defined very narrowly. Health is the absence of illness. That's all. That's health. Oh, you're not feeling well? It just so happens I have amoxicillin 250. You want one? You'll be fine. I'll also got strong ibuprofen for you. Ah, okay. Then, gone, headache gone. In fact, oh, happy, I'm healthy. Health, good health is more than that. Well-being is a holistic concept that takes the quantitative indicators of the material status of your health. Your body is paining here, paining there. Your temperature is too high, but there is much more. Rather than sitting here and spending the next 40 minutes trying to describe this for you, I will give you some examples, probably that is. In an interview done in Central America, when an ordinary peasant who has never been five miles near a school was asked the question, what do you think of development? Who do you think in your village is the most underdeveloped person? You might think this, oh, this peasant will, won't know. He said immediately, Pat came the reply. He said the most underdeveloped person is the person with no friends. <laughs> now you sit down and over a favorite cup of coffee, think about that. There's much more to life than just good health. Yes, we all want good health, but we also want a functioning family, a functional family relationships, not just relationships with human beings, relationships with nature. I've got a bad headache. One choice, take ibuprofen. Other choice, go for a walk on campus in the night. Just the clean air, green trees, I feel better. The problem is modernization has made us human beings walk more and more and more away from nature. It's taken, and we are willingly following like a bunch of sheep, you know? <laughs> and now today's kids, their whole world is in this damn screen. That's what is happening, okay? That is for another day. So I want to come back here. And so basically now is that health itself. Now how do you measure aspects of health like Friendship, harmonious relationship, you know, these are qualitative aspects. Okay, so you still have to measure them. Suddenly you've realized that, especially in areas like health, what can be more personal to you than your health? Is there anything more personal to you than your health? That's another one to think over your favorite cup of coffee. Okay, so these are important things. Again, you need to broaden health. Now, if you broaden health to well-being, not only the doctor with the MBBS and DCH and HCD and 4CD, whatever, and you, you both, he is very good or she is very good in the technical aspects. You know, you need to take this, this, this medicine, that medicine, you use this level is too high, this level. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with that. I don't know. Yeah, you say so, yeah. But at the end of the day, doctor, it's my body. It's my damn body. Don't you think I know something about my body? I've got living in this body for many years. So we do have things to say. In fact, now the latest thing is medical doctors lack communication skills. Those doctors with good communication skills are better doctors. They've also showed that higher the specialization of the doctor, lower are his or her communication abilities. Specialist, you go, I mean, he treats you like a cow. Huh? <laughs> ah. yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, they here, and then suddenly he'll pull out something, stick one here, stick one there. Ah. And then walks away. What am I? Am I a buffalo or something? I mean, I've got a name. You know, hello, how are you today? So anyway, that was, uh, that was not part of the lecture today. I just got carried away. Um, and communication was reserved for the transfer of information only. Now we are now, what are we talking about now? This is a field where you can expand this, okay? How do p ordinary people talk about health? How, do, how does our family deal with health and bad health, okay? Uh, our community, uh, we're not talking of technical aspects that can only be learned in a medical school, okay? What are the important health indicators in our community, okay? What are the important, you know, uh, for example, uh, in United States now, the major health epidemic today is not part of the program. People are taking overdoses of opioids and people are dying by millions. It's a crisis. Millions with uh, overdoses of uh, heroin, fentanyl, all illegal drugs are coming and okay. So, um, what are the problems? What are the health problems? All right. Um, we need a communication situation, not just for health, for anything. We say we need a public place where the public can gather to talk about public issues. That's what democracy is. Democracy is not going and putting one vote every few years active agency of the public and of course the government and being involved in issues. Be involved in issues. Don't say, oh, that's politics, dirty politics. No. Poli you be involved. Bring action. If there's something you don't like, something happening on campus you don't like, okay? You need to, you need to come together. As a student group, you have to act on it. That is what how change happens. Same way with health. What are the health problems? Okay. Now I've lived in Mysore. Uh, you know, I've come on sabbatical. I live in Mysore. Uh, let me give you some examples. And people walk around. I've lived in. By the way, I've lived in America for 38 years. I've lived in India for 30 years. No, I'm not that old. I've lived in, uh, in, uh, I've li in India for uh, 28 years, well, somewhere there. When I walk around in Mysore, people, both men and women, <laughs> then I walk around, this guy in front of me, <laughs> I thought, oh my God, he's going to, he's definitely going to spit on me. But actually, the poor guy, he just looked at me. Who, who is this white dude behind me? And then he spat on the ground. <laughs> so, for me, I started thinking, why do people spit like that? What is their problem? Until after 10 days in Mysore, one day I went <laughs> <laughs> I cannot spit in US even if I want to. That's why I guess people don't. By the way, US has other problems. I'm not saying US is, I'm not saying US is heaven. I'm just this example. Why? I spit in my soul because there is stuff in my throat. There is no stuff in my throat in USA. And you know how, how bad that stuff is. You know what I'm talking about, okay? Where does it come from? Magic? Where does it come from? It comes from the air I breathe. And where do I go? I don't go to some contaminated sites and all that, go sniffing everything. I am just walking in the gullies of my, you know, just doing, going to market, picking bananas, coming milk, dandini milk, you know. That's all I'm doing. Air quality is bad. So air quality is bad. So if I had a community association in Jalakshmi Puram, I would get and I would really go early to the meeting and put on the agenda, 
Why do people keep burning things in Mysore? I think, I believe they burn everywhere. Yeah, huh? Ah, it was partly my fault. I said, well, what is the problem? So I actually one day I went and asked one person, why do you do that Yakri Marte Ranta? So that fellow said, sir, if I don't do that, nobody is going to pick that up. I have to do it. See, where is, so now the health, every time they burn, I mean, it is not benign. I'm not going to scare you guys. That smoke is not benign. Please, if you can put a handkerchief, please put, because the carbon particles in a smoke are so small that they will go into the innermost parts of your lungs and cannot come out. So, our municipalities maybe should do more work. So, keeping uh, Swachh Bharat is not just you and me sweeping and you know, Swachh Bharat is more than that. Municipality is doing their job. Uh, trash being picked up so that people don't have to burn. Health is a holistic concept. It's not always a technical thing. So, we can say there are a lot of health problems in our community. Too much of burning. Uh, how can we bring this to the, the notice of our, uh, of our authorities? Uh, something else, something else. So this is, a, this is what we need, active agency of the people. And this requires a different kind of communication, and that is called participatory communication. In a participatory communication, you don't have SMCR in a straight line. You have a situation like a more like a circular model where there is an interchange of messages and ideas and so on. It is more participatory, all right? And that is how communication should be. Next, oh, I can do that. So that is basically, uh, okay, so I'm going to end with this. Participatory communication is better suited to bring commonness, to bring actors together through participation, through understanding, through empathy, okay? And communication is more than just information transfer. And also, health is something that needs to be problematized, uh, you know, and the agenda for what are the things that our society must be looking at in terms of health, people need to be also involved. And so, basically then, today, we have in any postgraduate program, we offer both the quantitative and the qualitative aspects. That's one thing. Qualitative methodology are good for dealing with those kinds of research where the information or the variables we are working with are qualitative in the sense that feelings, emotions, you know, relationships, they cannot be described or should not be described through numbers. Quantitative on the other hand is used for other kinds of research where you collect quantitative data and look for relationships. So both have a place and uh, what I want to do, do we have the the other PowerPoint or shall I work on this one? I want to stop this and I want to move to another PowerPoint. Um, the second one. Do you have it saved or shall I open it here? Yeah, that one. Can you please open that? I can control from here? Yeah. What, where do I point? Like that? Okay, what I want to do here, I'm kind of abrupt because of sake of time. I want to bring it more into mass media and communication technology, which is uh, probably a little more interesting to the electronic media students. Um, and so I've given you now a broad idea of some of the major models and theories we have used one looking at change in a certain way, another trying looking at change in a certain way. Now let us look at uh, specifically at how technologies have been used in development. And when we say technology, I'm talking of information and communication technology, ICT. And uh, these days in United Nations literature and other literature, this body of work is called ICT4D, as you can see 
on the first line it is uh, said as information communication technologies for development. Uh, this became very popular uh, that actually my second sentence is not actually correct in the in not in the new millennium it became popular for the new media the digital media in the new millennium but radio and TV predate uh, and they so it did become very popular we just looked at it in the earlier slide the mass media 50s 60s 70s radio and TV okay uh, but with the coming of the new media starting in the 1990s 1990s was a transformative period in human history okay that is when some of the major technologies uh, that bedrock technology today were born at that time what are the two internet is one what's the second which we on which we everything rests huh? Google is a service company World Wide Web that's how we can attach you know make a tag of things and www worldwide anyway so since the 1990s uh, the you can actually the two worlds that separate the 1990s separates are so different digital technologies have become very popular when we talk digital technologies we are talking about our laptops and our internets and our later on our smartphones and all that so ICTs um, so we are going to now specifically talk about um, ICTs what's just give me one six one second please Okay, um, is this the one? Yeah, that's the one. Um, okay. Um, when we use the term ICTs, a lot of people think it's only di digital communication technologies. Not. All electronic media also come under ICTs. And radio and TV are electronic media. And radio came in the 1920s, and television came, the technology of television came in the 1940s. So it's pretty old, um, older than the new commun so communication technologies. So we use both the legacy media, radio and TV are called legacy media, and we also use the new media and call them as ICTs. Um, and so the, uh, the, I don't have, I, I had marked all of this, but because of some technology problems I'm having, um, I won't be able to give you the definition as in the book, uh, but I can do that right now. Um, here is, I'm, by the way, this is my book, Communication for Development. Uh, this is the third edition which came out in 2015, yeah, uh, this is the book that the uh, professor was talking about. Information and communication technologies comprise a complex and heterogeneous set of goods, applications and services used to produce, distribute, process and transfer information. They include the outputs of industries as diverse as telecommunications, television and radio broadcasting, computer hardware and software, computer services and electronic media such as internet, e emails and computer games. So that is one definition for you of what ICTs are. And so remember that when we talk of ICTs, we are most of the time looking at applications and services. Okay? Um, and we are not interested in hardware, we are not engineers. We deal mostly with the software. And we academics deal with uh, the theory behind the ideas and we talk about methodology, that's what we do. So um, ICTs to summit have become very important in development. And uh, radio was used, as I said earlier, and then the television was used. The site experiment I was telling you about used television, okay? But in the early days, 
as I was telling you in the earlier one, the radio and TV were used as part of the modernization model. They were used uh, because they believed that people lacked information and we had to give them information or we had to somehow change their attitudes. Okay? And the problem did not lie with the people's attitudes, though sometimes they do. Sometimes a attitudes, uh, uh, you know, uh, make uh, positive, at negative attitudes may have a direct uh, relationship by not performing a behavior because you have a negative attitude about it. That, that, that is true. But our, our behaviors cannot be described just based on our individual behaviors and, and I'm sorry, on our individual attitudes and awareness and stuff like that. There are external conditions that may be responsible for some of the things and so some of the, uh, some of the problems we have. So for example, I was making fun of, oh, uh, you know, you must have only two children. And I, I kind of, uh, I was kind of making joke about it. I'll take that example and tell about that the message is so simplistic. You're blasting messages at rural areas in the 1970s saying you shouldn't have more than two kids, you know. And you think that these people are producing a lot of kids because they don't know. Or because they have this negative mindset, you know. They're not educated like us. They don't know what overpopulation is going to do. That is the mindset of the experts. And therefore, we have to change their attitudes. Maybe that is not the main problem. Maybe the problem is infant mortality in the rural areas is very high, which it is. One of the indicators of development is infant mortality at age one. Many children die before they see their first birthday, which might be a shock to you and me who live in cities. Um, another indicator is infant mortality at age five. Many kids die before they see their fifth birthday. So maybe these people, maybe, I don't know. I'm, they, there are no doctors in rural areas. There are no medicines available in rural areas. You know, and if I go with your advice and have only two kids, and my bad luck, my kids die, then what am I going to do? Plus, because of lack of economic development, I have a lot of chores at home. I have things to be done at home. More kids, you know, more yeah, more. These are socioeconomic conditions. The government would find it very hard to change these because these require money. These require policies, right? And so all the time the problem was people, people, and forget. And about queuing in the bus, form a queue. In 1970s, we have, I've seen, form a queue. And what is queue? They'll also tell us what a queue is. A queue is a straight line. <laughs> Did you know that? A queue is a straight line. Okay, okay, straight line. If I stand in the queue in Bangalore in the bus, no, I'll be in the queue till 9 o'clock in the night only. <laughs> I won't get into the bus. If I have to get into the bus, I have to break the queue. I have to come at you, push you aside. <laughs> if possible, go under your legs. <laughs> I, I follow the queue here many times, not for buses. I don't, I don't go by buses anymore. But in other places, even in airports, I'm giving my, get, trying to get my boarding pass and suddenly one guy is in front of me. I do not know how he came. I'm a student of physics and I believe that physical objects don't appear <laughs> from thin air. I know that. How did this man appear? <coughs> anyway, things like that. So people don't queue because you do not have enough buses. If you had enough buses, people will queue. If you've gone to Hong Kong, Hong Kong is a fabulous city. I'm a number of people in that city but their buses and their trains go like that. They, every three seconds there's a metro. During rush hour, during rush hour. Three seconds, three to five. So, there, and by the way, there are straight line queues there. Line, lines. People will go and start line up, even before the train comes. Because the carriage will come and stop exactly there. It's all completely driverless trains, electric. So, and boom, three seconds, 
door opens, one uh, people exit, people get in, door closes, go, three seconds, another one. If we had uh, buses every five minutes, people will queue. So there are other reasons. It's not just attitudes, all right? So this is, with two examples, I just wanted to make that clear for you. <coughs> so under the modernization model, mass media were used. Unfortunately, thinking that Eastern attitudes, values, religious values were the problem, okay? And basically, ICT for development replicated those biases, okay? So basically put the fault back on the people. You are backward because of some of your attitudes, some of your lifestyle, some of this, some of that, rather than trying to find fault with the socioeconomic conditions of the society. So it was basically a re-articulation of the modernization idea paradigm, okay? Um, Yes. Uh, what is the difference, like, uh, how in America, how people are really fun in, in the matter of technology development? Why if, 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 if I see Indian fantasy social, I would see it. I don't know what, okay, we will have to go into lots, all kinds of indicators. Um, first of all, I, they might be ahead in some areas, but they're actually behind in many other areas. So that's, 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 another, uh, that's another topic that I'm not dealing with you. Uh, certainly, whatever the reason is, it is not because they have some superior culture. That's the point I'm trying to make, okay? Because superstitions are there among them too. Do you know that if 13th falls on a Friday, half the offices are empty. 13th Friday is very bad luck. Do you know in many hotels in the West, including Singapore, the lift does not have a 13, number 13. From 12, you go to 14. That is a silly superstition. And it is the Westerners. We don't have a problem with 13 in India. We have maybe, we have problems with something else. A black cat went in front of you. <laughs> what should I do? Should I go forward, backward, you know? Anyway, so all I'm trying to say is that, I'm, that, I'm thank you for that question. I want to, um, what I'm trying to do is attack that basic premise. Let me give you, since he has asked the question, let me give you another example to show that it's not the culture that was holding the people down. Maybe it was something else. The same Indians, whether they were Muslims or whether they were Hindus, when they migrated to East Africa, they became the richest people in those countries through their hard work. Indians in Kenya, Indians in Uganda, Indians in South Africa. They didn't give up their religion. In fact, they became, once they went out of the India, they became more conservative in their respective religions. Japan is as modern as any of the Western country, but Japan has, is completely traditional. So it's not, Chinese, when they left China and then moved to countries like Singapore and Malaysia and Hong Kong, the richest and the most hardworking, they didn't give up their religion, Confucianism and other b beliefs. So there's a lot of problems. Uh, unless your dad or your mom or somebody in your family was an IAS officer or a big businessman, chances of a phone in your house, you know, was rare. It took an average of five years in Bangalore to get a phone. And that too, if you're lucky. 
okay? Five years to get a phone. And uh, I don't think we could have ever reached a situation where today everybody, I'm sure most of you here have a phone in your bag or in your pocket. I have two actually. <laughs> okay? Um, that's very good because India could not have wired every house. It's very expensive to wire houses. Landline would not have been possible. That was part of the reason why in the government did not want to, you know, they thought that telephone is a toy of the rich. And of course, we are now benefiting from wireless technology and uh, Wi-Fi technology. And so that has helped us to leapfrog different stages of development. That's the point I made here. Jump straight from no telephone to everybody having one telephone in their pocket and not having to put wires, okay? Um, moving along then, uh, can we move on to the next one? What are ICTs? ICTs may be described as electronic means of capturing, processing, storing, and communicating information. And today our technologies are digital. Okay, so we have moved from analog now almost completely to digital. What does the digital signal look like? Zeros and ones, zeros and ones. And so zeros and ones and uh, you know, it all has so many bits make a byte, so many bytes make a kilobyte and so on and so forth. And uh, analog on the other hand is converting sound into electricity and then sending it through electromagnetic waves and then con converting it back into electricity and then converting it back to sound. Same with shadow and light in the case of TV. Okay, so uh, today digital technologies, as you all know, internet, satellite, uh, phones, um, uh, you know, mobile phones, um, uh, satellite dishes, all of these are examples of, um, and laptops and computers, okay. And ICTs today are connect all of us in this world, the globe, in a web of um, connections. That's why we call, we call that as globalization. We are so tightly wound. Uh, we are all connected in so many ways across the world um, and uh, all kinds of real-time interactions and transactions. And ICTs have proliferated all around the world, even if you don't like it. Uh, there's very little you can do about it. Actually, we all like it. Imagine your life without your phone. <laughs> Terrible, no? That's how we spent our youth. Um, here is some data, this is dated actually, this is only recent till about 2013. Mobile phone subscriptions around the world have reached 6.8 billion in 2013. Uh, so that's the 100% penetration. Of course, that doesn't mean everybody has a phone. Some people have more phones, like me. Um, <coughs> Between the years of 20, 2006 and 2013, internet access has gone from 360 million homes in the world to 750 million homes, double, in a matter of seven years. And we have a total of 1.8 billion houses in the world. Um, and so that's 750 out of 1.8 in 2013 is a pretty big number. Internet users went from 1.15 billion to 2.27 billion in between 2006 and 11, that's an increase of 97%. Another big thing on which our the quality of our life will lead uh, will uh, uh, depend is uh, broadband. Broadband, and uh, what is broadband? Broadband are basically signal uh, uh, channels that can carry very dense information quickly. So you can buffer, you can see a movie on your TV without it buffering, okay? And so broadband is, that is the last, at least right now, we need good broadband. And that has gone from, uh, broadband subscriptions have gone from 268 million 
268 million to over 2 billion, almost 10 times between 2007 and 13. And the speed, the speed with which you get stuff, and today we want greater and greater speed. It went from uh, high speed internet from 11,000 gigabits in 2006 to 80,000 gigabits in 2011. Now, of course, it is like 150 gigabits, you know, Mbps. That is Mbps, how fast your signal is. That is basically, and it, it, the trajectory is only going up. So digital technologies have immense power. They have proliferated all over the world. And they are the iconic symbols of globalization. Globalization, on the one hand, is a concept. But on the other hand, it is actually real. Globalization is where we are wired up. We are all connected. Um, each one of us are connected through our technologies. Our banks are connected. Uh, everything is connected, you know. Your weatherman in on, at 6 o'clock today will tell you, tomorrow it's going to rain in Bangalore. Okay? How do they know? Because they are collecting data. And data says moist air plus dry air plus this wind plus that wind will lead to rain. So we basically, um, we, and, and, and if you know that uh, this whole area is going to rain, then you're going to take precaution. So basically then, uh, everything is connected. That, that's basically, and at the center of this are media. And I'm not talking again of information transfer. Banks, a bank, you know, you can go leave Bangalore and tomorrow take a flight and go to Delhi and, it, and you can still put your ATM card in, a, in your favorite bank's ATM machine and if there is money in your account, you can still pull out money, right? That's globalization for you. You know, your money is there everywhere. Uh, and uh, it doesn't matter where. So similarly, um, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking of a different kind of communication. I'm talking about cultural communication. I'm not talking of transfer. I'm talking about your TV networks, your radios, um, the messages that come out. And uh, so ICTs are iconic symbols of the present globalized world. Some exa ICTs have a lot of good uh, applications. Uh, a lot of development applications, ICTs can do a very good job. Okay, they can individualize instruction. Uh, they can, uh, you can adapt them for more uh, individual uh, kinds of situations. They have been used in agriculture, they have been used in medicine, they have been used in marketing, and all of that. So there's, uh, the, generally, this, the, we all seem to be quite happy. We seem to be quite happy with our technologies. And certainly, whether we are happy or not, we, are, we have all dived very well, and we are, we are lapping up all the stuff that ICTs are able to provide us, okay? And so they do play a very, uh, what role do they play in our lives? They play a very, very important role in our lives. Now, let me get critical. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> That's why I get paid, to poke your brain a little bit and make you smell the coffee, right? The medium is the message. Have you heard this? McLuhan. Anyone knows what McLuhan meant when he said the medium is the message? Marshall McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan. A medium is supposed to carry a message, right? But McLuhan is saying a medium not only carries a message, the medium is the message. The medium itself is the message. What he is trying to say is that medium, every medium has certain characteristics. Those characteristics we are going to call as bias. So each medium brings its bias. As long as you understand it and take precaution, you're okay. So that's why you need to be reflective. You need to think what you're doing. What are some of the biases of different technologies, right? And For example, uh, he talked about uh, when human beings started, the mode of communication was interpersonal speech. That's all we did until printing was invented, until writing was invented. So when we speak, our spoken communication has certain characteristics, right? In order to understand my spoken communication, A, you have to be close to me. 
I cannot be here and you be five miles away and I can still talk to you. So spoken interpersonal communication happens among close communities, units, in a limited geography, okay? And you need all five senses to make sense of oral communication. Now he went on to writing. What did writing do? Writing did a lot of things. Now suddenly you could communicate with people who are not here with you. If you're not here with me, I can write you a letter. And you can read my letter over there and I can communicate with you, right? So writing or, or uh, uh, making inscriptions on rock helped empires grow because now they could pass messages across larger distances. And like that, from writing we went to print. Print gave us a huge jump. Now with printing, we, we could communicate with people who are thousands and thousands of miles away. Industrialization brought that about. The, the print books, it started taking knowledge and things wider. So now we could, we could live far away and still communicate. These are all, each medium brings its own characteristics. The print medium always goes from left to right. In some languages, it goes from right to left. A few languages, it goes from top to bottom. But it always goes in straight lines. Have you seen a circular language? They write in circles? No. That is a bias. Whereas uh, radio and TV communication, we cannot even think of them as direction. They are, you know, they are a montage of signals. Those are some of the things that Marshall McLuhan has talked about. And so um, we have to understand each one of these. So I'll just pick up a few because I, I should be, um, you know, um, stopping. These kinds of technologies that you use, they have good things, but they also have bad things. Well, at least I think yeah. are bad, okay? These kinds of things are communicators with other human beings. They're having problems. Young men and women are having problems dating because they can't talk. Uh, you're always hiding behind that screen, you know, and you're taking on this avatar and, you know, you're typing stuff. Um, family communication is breaking down. It's very easy for me. Um, probably you have seen it. Uh, I, see, I go to a restaurant and there's this family in front of me, father, mother, two kids. Uh, I'm sure the parents are spending good money in that restaurant. But what are they all doing? Each one is... <laughs> That's all, you know. So these, these are all things that are some of the other characteristics, you know. I'm just giving you some silly examples, but they do, they do make you different, you know, from an earlier generation, all right. And so uh, these are some of the things. Every medium brings these. Uh, there are other problems with these. Uh, they are in, they, it, you know, uh, for some people it is, uh, it is leading to lack of physical exercise bad health, people watch too much TV, and to watch TV you just have to be nicely seated in a comfortable place, right? And then you eat TV food, potato chips, some other stuff, you know, and these are all biases, okay? And so we need to understand what we're doing, what kind of a society are we going to become with these kinds of technologies, you know, and then um, uh, basically what you have to, what you have to ask is, um, the technology by itself is not development, okay? What messages that technology carries, that has to be looked at, okay? And so we have to separate the technology from the information it produces and carries, all right? And uh, I don't know, it's uh, in a short time, I can't pull out the thing, so I think I'll, I won't. Is the use, more and more use of certain technologies empowering certain kind of people? Okay. Are some people being left out? Today, um, computer technology has become a must for everybody. But are there a significant number of people in your country who lack access to those technologies, especially children? 
what is going to happen to that generation, next generation of children who graduate through school without having played with a computer? How competitive are they going to be in the world? You know? The, so technology is great, but you also need to ask questions about, about other things that relate to technology. And, and so, um, and not only that, we also have to look at how people can use technology uh, in a way that is useful to them. And uh, <laughs> that was so, that was so up to a point. Uh, but uh, they, you know, history has showed that there's been quite a resistance to that. Uh, but definitely the first 50 years after Second World War, this is certain kinds of parts of the world to populate at a certain rate. Because the West population has been going down for the last... It's made in China. U.S., everything is made in China. Okay? So, actually China capitalized on that. And India could also... But India has to do a uh, really hard job with educating its population. Someone said, in India, you'll have to construct a school every day. You can't help it. You, uh, you, uh, that's one. India has to do a much better job with health care. And I'm not talking of cities like Bangalore. We are, don't, don't even look at us. I'm talking of the rural India. So access to basic health care, India has to do a much better job. India suffers from uh, other things like clogged transportation bottlenecks. India has very bad roads. India also has problems with energy production. So these are some of the four things. Uh, there are many more. So there are a lot of difficult decisions. Yeah, that is because, uh, because of our energy problem. The another thing I forgot to tell you is, India has such acute energy problem. This it happened to us, our electricity went off. And so, we cannot continue to have these